fascinating story. Uh, I was actually at Morristown um, last summer. Uh, Dillard Kirby had me out. Uh, the friends of Morristown, they are uh, a group who were really promoting the town um, and trying to really build it up as like the next Valley Forge, the park there. Uh, so it's fascinating. There's also a movie in the works based on my book. Um, the script writers have been at it for about a year. Um, so it's a very really fascinating topic to a lot of people. I discovered um, this plot to kidnap George Washington from a new uh, magazine article I was reading. And, um, you know, I didn't know anything about it. And I just started from there to do some research and jumped right in. And, you know, Morristown is really something that's been overlooked, this, this part of uh, the revolution. Um, but it really, it was the darkest time of the revolution. So let's kind of, with that, let's jump into this. Uh, really, the British and the Americans were sort of, at this point, uh, 1779, like two boxers, just, you know, sort of weary, but looking for a knockout punch. Um, uh, the war had become unpopular, um, and really, on both sides, uh, the British were tired of pumping all this money out um, and, you know, not being able to get the Americans... The American populace was had grown weary of the war. It was expensive, um, and people just you know it it had it had been dragged on a while. So so people were really sort of looking for a way out. They're looking for something where they could get the upper hand. Um, the war really had become a, a sort of war of attrition for the British, um, where they would try and nail the Americans down, but they couldn't do it. Uh, they, you know, the, the Americans would bob and weave. George Washington, um, especially, was very, very uh, good at using the tactics of what, of what later would be the Viet Cong tactics, which is really sort of hit and run. Uh, these this sort of uh, you know method of hitting the British and then taking off. And to the British, they, you know, who believed, you know armies should fight like men and line up in front of each other and shoot in volleys. Uh, the, Brit the Americans had wanted no part of that. So they would, they would shoot at the British, pick them off, and then melt into the forest. And this drove the British crazy because, you know, again, the Americans felt like if they could just stay alive and stay in the war, uh, the British would eventually tire and leave. And, and certainly this, this was occurring. So by 1779, the, the British retired. The Americans were just, you know, trying to hang on. And Washington takes his army to Morristown to winter. Um, now, he, Morristown was behind the, was the Washington Mountains there and the, uh, very close to New York. So he could kind of keep an eye on the British who were going to be uh, basically making that their winter camp. Um, so for Washington, it was, it was a good place for him to hole up for the winter and try and you know, lick their wounds and be ready to fight in the spring. This is a time when wars were fought in the spring and summer. Uh, the, during the winter, both sides retired and then came out to fight in the spring. Now, the whole plot to kidnap George Washington came about really, really from this guy, uh, General Simcoe. Um, General Simcoe hated the Americans. He hated being over there. This British general hated being, you know, in fighting in the colonies in North America. He, he, he wanted to be back at home. And he, he felt um, that the, you know, the Americans weren't even worthy of being called an army. They were just a rabble. Um, and so what's going to happen to him is he's going to get caught by the Americans. And then he's going to be thrown into a, a jail um, with basically these other prisoners. And he felt this was a great insult to him, a personal insult. And he demanded to be let go. And, and the Americans did not let him go. And so he wrote a letter to George Washington saying that, you know, this kind of treatment was uh, a great insult to an officer. And he demanded to be let go. And Washington said, all right, I'll trade you. And they go to try and trade him. And uh, Simcoe says, no, you know, they're going to trade some privates for him. He said, no. You know, you must trade officers for me. And so, you know, this guy had a huge ego. But by the time he finally got released, he felt he had been insulted and he hated 
George Washington for it, and he really vowed revenge. Now, well, how about Washington and his troops? Well, they were they were worn down. Um, uh, no money, uh, very little food. Um, the troops never got paid. Uh, a lot of them had very little clothing, especially even for the winter. A lot were barefoot. Um, and there was a real problem with desertion and disease. Um, so, you know, when they went into winter camp, uh, they were an army that was just barely holding together. And again, the, the country really wasn't quite sure which way this war was going to go. A lot of people felt like the, you know, the Americans were going to lose eventually. And so, like a lot of wars, people start to pick a side. And, you know, for the, for the Americans, it was probably 50-50 at this point. 50% of the population felt like, hey, we should just make peace with the British and be done with this. And 50% said, no, we should go for independence. And again, uh, you know, people did not want to give Washington food you know, because the army basically had to be fed by foraging. So uh, a lot of farmers would hide their food from him, uh, hide the food from the army, and the army knew this. And so there was a lot of bad feelings about this. All right, so you, to understand what happened in this winter of 1779, we have to understand this was the coldest winter in a century. Um, this was a once in a century winter where it just started to snow, it then stopped and it kept snowing. And then the temperature dropped and it stayed, stayed below zero. Um, it got so cold that the Hudson froze. And this is going to be a big part of, you know, how they go and, you know, have this plot to kidnap George Washington. This is going to affect um, the very way the war will be conducted. Because for the first time, you could cross the Hudson. And you could cross it with cannons, men, horses. It was frozen. So it became, this moat now became a bridge for both sides. But again, for the British especially. Now, let's talk about Washington a little bit. He's a very interesting guy. In a way, he he was a very meticulous man. His famous quote was, every mickle makes a muckle, which small things add up. When he would have work done to Mount Vernon, he would supervise it personally and write, even during the war, he'd write all these letters of things that he wanted done to the workmen. I mean, he just, he was a very hands-on guy, very detail-oriented. At the same time, he had this wild streak in him uh, that, you know, came out. I wrote a book called Henry Knox's Noble Train. And basically, he sent this 25-year-old bookseller to get 60 tons of cannon um, to drag all the way to uh, Boston when the British were occupying it uh, over mountains and frozen lakes and, uh, you know, just incredible hardship. Uh, and in frozen rivers, and he did it. And this, he, this is how he was able to force the British out of Boston in one of the first battles that he could declare a victory. And everybody said he was crazy to do it. He was crazy to have these this guy, Henry Knox, who had no idea what he was doing in terms of you know, dragging these cans. But he, as you see here, he used oxen and sleds, and, and he pulled it off. He was gone for three months, but when he came back, he came back with 60 tons of cannon. And so... He was able to put it up on Dorchester Heights and bomb the British, and the British basically evacuated, got into the ships, and left. Now, another time he did this was crossing the Delaware. Uh, again, you know, the, the British thought they had the Americans. They figured they'd finish them off in, uh, you know, in 1776. They figured they'd finish them off uh, in the spring, and Washington decides to cross the Delaware and go attack the, you know, the Hessian troops and, you know, the mercenaries that are all asleep just across the river in, in terrible weather on Christmas Eve. And, and, you know, again, people thought this is crazy. And it was crazy because the weather was horrible. Uh, the chances of this working out were a thousand to one. Uh, three, three battalions, if you will, set out to do it. Two of them turned back because of the weather. Washington's is the only one that made it. But you know, the, the British troops didn't know what hit them when they hit them and they got a big route and they had a victory, which did a lot for American morale. So he has this wild man streak in him. They, he does the unexpected. 
And this is really a war of unconventional methods. Um, you know, here, this is what's called the turtle. Uh, this is something the Americans experimented with. It's a very early submarine. And basically what the, what, how the turtle worked is a man would get in it, he'd pedal it uh, to a British ship sitting in a harbor. And with that little drill on the front there, he'd bore, a, bore into the side, leave a torpedo there that would blow up and sink the ship. Well, when they tried it, it didn't work out. They went to bore into the ship and they found out there's metal plating around the rudder. He couldn't get into it. The British spotted him. They started to try and blow it up. And, you know, it sunk. The man had to swim out of it. So, but this was a, a war. Of, they were trying different things, you know. And one of the things that was part of this warfare was to kidnap people. Um, this was a big part of war at the time. You tried to kidnap uh, a general or a leader, if you could. And, and this would change the war. It's sort of like taking off the, a chess piece, taking your king off the board. Uh, and in fact, uh, there was a plot to kill uh, George Washington in New York that, you know, went very far. Uh, he had a, what's called a lifeguard unit, sort of a secret service, early secret service. And some of his men were involved in this plot. And they came very close to executing this plot. Washington found out about it. They arrested some, some of the plotters. Uh, they hung yeah. the gentleman who was in his lifeguard unit um, for his uh, being involved in it. But Washington also kept this very hush-hush. He didn't want people to know how close they came to succeeding because this, would again, would be bad for morale. Um, you know, in this... This was also viewed as part of war. So, you know, this this plot to kidnap him, uh, to kill him was probably looked down on a little bit, but it was definitely in the realm of the game, if you will. Now, as we talked about before, this is Benedict Arnold. Um, a lot of people at this point were betting that America was going to lose the war. Um, Benedict Arnold was one of those people. Benedict Arnold was a great general. He did a lot of things uh, that helped the cause. He, he led some great victories for the Americans, but he also had some defeats and he suffered. His leg had been shot up several times and he had a permanent limp. It would, it would get infected. Uh, he had lost his money because uh, the currency, you know, the, uh, the currency of the colonies, um, you know, the young United States uh, was worthless. It was the old joke was, uh, you know, continental uh, dollars were not worth the wheelbarrow they were all in. It was true. And so, you know, Bennett Darnold had married up and he had a wife who was very, very motivated, uh, who, who, you know, demanded a certain lifestyle and this put a lot of pressure on him. And so he started to feel like, you know, I want mine out of this. We're going to lose this anyway. So I deserve to get something out of this war than coming out broke wounded um and you know my wife and my children not really having a future so he contacts the british and this is all going on while you know washington has gone up to morristown and he tells them listen i'll uh, i'll sell washington out for you i'll give you uh west point the um the fort and i want ten thousand dollars the british were like okay uh Prove it, you know, do it. And, and so Arnold starts this. He starts all these machinations. And, and Arnold is very, very trusted by George Washington. Um, uh, and, and so he's very close to Washington while he's doing all this. And he's giving the British inside information on Washington about his strength in Morristown, uh, a lot of things. So, but he basically, his bottom line is, I want the 10,000 and then I want to go live in Britain. And the British said, fine, get us the fort. Okay. Meanwhile... Washington has a log city constructed in Morristown. Um, and of course, as I'm sure a lot of you know, there's a few of these left. Um, you can go see them. Here it is here. It is here. I was, when I was in Morristown, I went and saw this um, last summer. But this was huge. This was, you know, thousands of these little log cabins. And Washington, again, was very, very meticulous uh, some would say rigid about their construction. You had to construct it, you know, under with a certain amount of wood. It had to be a certain size. 
The door had to be a certain place, a window, the chimney, everything had to be uniform. So it was really like a log city when it was all done. And when the men were building it, I go into this in the book a lot, they were sleeping in the snow. Um, they, they had no, no structures. And Washington, because he demanded they do it a certain way, they couldn't really hurry it up and just throw something together. Everything had to be done according to plan. So, you know, a lot of men spent a lot of the winter outside building their log cabins. Now, what about Washington? Where is he? Well, he's staying in the Ford mansion, all right? And uh, Mr. Ford had passed on. His, his wife and kids were still there. Uh, but this is where, you know, Washington is going to have his headquarters. And here's the thing to keep in mind. It's miles from the troops, okay? It's, it's miles from his troops, and Washington has a lifeguard unit. Now, what's a lifeguard unit? Washington's lifeguard unit is basically a secret service, but also uh, he, he handpicked them. They're big men for their time. Um, they're his trusted men. And they also do a lot of duties for Washington, you know, taking doctors. Remember, Washington's running a big war. And so, you know, let's go back to the mansion here. He's in here. And Mrs. Ford is not crazy about him being there because, you know, young adjutants are running in and out all day long. All these messengers are running out. I mean, Washington would say often he had terrible, terrible headaches from all the paperwork he had to complete. He was constantly bent over his desk working on paperwork, which is not the image of George Washington we have, but this is very true. And the warmest room in the house was the kitchen. Uh, and this, because this was a brutally cold uh, winter, you know, a lot of these rooms did have fireplaces, but Washington and a lot of his men worked in that same area that, you know, Mrs. Ford and her children were in. So there was a lot of people were stepping in there, even some letters from Mrs. Ford who wrote to other people saying, I hope he leaves soon. Um, so again, you know, people were for the revolution, at least half of the population was, but they were also tired of the revolution. And Mrs. Ford was probably in that group that was just sort of tired of all this. But again, so Washington is far from his main body of troops. And his lifeguard unit, by the way, is not staying in the Ford mansion either. They're staying off a little ways in a different encampment. Okay, so let's go back to our man Simcoe. Simcoe has what's called the Queen Rangers. Uh, and, you know, General Simcoe basically created this force himself. They have short rifles. Uh, they know how to, they're trained to shoot on, you know, at a full gallop. Uh, they're sort of like SEAL Team 6, if you will, of 1779. And, you know, they're hit and run. That's what, how they're designed. They're really fast horses. And it's a, it's a very compact force that Simcoe came up with. Um, now, in Simcoe's mind, when he comes up with this plan to kidnap George Washington, uh, it's going to be the Queen's Rangers who do it, all right? And his plan is very simple. He had been watching the Hudson freeze, and that's what gave him the idea. When my book opens, one of the first scenes uh, of Morristown is Simcoe standing on the Hudson at night looking across this frozen river right in the middle and realizing that Washington is now vulnerable. And and he and so he starts to devise his plan. His plan is simple. He'll cross the Hudson at night with the Queen's Rangers. All right. So the and again, you know, there's no problem. This thing is frozen solid, so it's going to hold men, horses, cannons, everything. Then they'll gallop 35 miles up to Morristown, and there's a lot of information on Washington because there's a lot of spies. All right, and a lot of the populace were loyalists, so they would let the British know what's going on. Uh, so then they would they'd gallop the 35 miles, and this was all based on surprise, this whole you know, plot, this whole mission to get Washington. So then they would leave their horses in a swamp and sneak up in moccasins to the Ford Mansion. And by the way, Simcoe knows exactly where Washington is in the Ford Mansion, thanks to spies. They told him he sleeps in the back with his wife in the back bedroom. So they know exactly where he is. They come up in, mo in moccasins. They figure they they know a few of the lifeguard will be there. They'll you know kill them or you know overcome them with a knife or something. And then they'll go into Washington's bedroom while he's sleeping next to Martha, pluck him out, and 
take him, you know, and by the way, they are not observing any niceties. They're not going to let him dress. They're just going to pull him out in his nightgown. Everybody slept in those nightgowns. There's a guy named General Lee who basically was in a brothel. As a, uh, and he got taken by the British, thrown on a horse, you know, right out of the brothel. Uh, he was one of General, uh, General Washington's top generals, uh, but he was a very outspoken general. And so the British knew exactly where he was take him out of his brothel and they threw him on in his nightgown and rode him through the night and held him for ransom. So, you know, they weren't going to waste any time because they figured if people are alerted, the lifeguards alerted or his troops are alerted, you know, they're going to have real problems. So then what they'll do is they'll throw him on a horse and then they'll ride back before the Americans even know what hit them. Once they're across the Hudson, they're good. They're, they're back into the British camp. So really it's a, it's a perfect plan that could not be done any other time in history, except for now when this incredibly cold winter hit. Um, and by the way, these snowstorms had made Morristown very hard to reach. And this also gave Washington a lot, a lot of confidence that there's no way people could get him. Well, Washington, through his spies, okay, both sides have spies, Washington spies, Tell them, listen, there's there's a plan underfoot. And we think they may be coming up here to try and take you. And Washington is like, don't worry about it. I'm perfectly protected. I don't think anybody can make it up here in these in this weather. And that was really his thought. His thought was, you know, one of the scenes in Morristown is he's in uh the, a room in his headquarters in the Ford mansion, and he's writing back to uh, some other generals and other people who warned him of this plot that's, you know, that they, they're, they're hearing these rumors that they're, the British are going to try and snatch him. And, and he says, that's ridiculous. He's like, you know, I'm, I'm protected. And also nobody could ever come up here in this kind of weather. And that is because of this, because these continual snowstorms would not only rage for three days, but then the temperature would drop uh, to unheard levels. And so men were literally freezing on guard. They, in 30 minutes, they were freezing and they were, some were dying. It was, it was brutal, it was brutal. And, it, and in a way, it was much, much worse than Valley Forge because Valley Forge, the winter was not that brutal. But, you know, this winter was brutal. Um, again, food was, was scarce, disease was way up, and also there was a lot of desertions. A lot of these troops were deserting. They were like, I've had it. You know, I haven't been paid. I have, you know, I have to get back to my farm. Um, you know, I've given my all. It doesn't seem like the rest of the country is supporting us. Um, and so this actually led to, incredibly as it seems, a mutiny. Uh, there were, what happened was, the troops suddenly started marching on their own and they started marching around and trying to leave uh, the camp. Uh, they said they were going to go look for food and Washington met them uh, and said, you know, where are you going? They said, well, we, we've got to, we've got to go forage ourselves. We, you know, we, we can't stay here. And then basically they were saying, we're now in command ourselves. And Washington sat there and explained to them, we're going to get you food but you have to stay in here. You have to stay in the camp because if, if I let you go, then the, the army is going to break apart. And he was right. The army was breaking apart. Um, you know, there hadn't been a victory in a long time. The British were wearing them down and the army was basically falling apart in real time. But Washington does turn them back around. He was an inspirational figure. The men really pledged allegiance to more to Washington than they did to the American Revolution. So the British actually hear all this. The British know that Washington's on the ropes and they figure, you know, if they can get him, it's over. Because they, to them, Washington's the American Revolution. And they, were, they weren't far wrong. George Washington was half deity, half commander. Um, he was the American Revolution. And, you know, and Washington was a very powerful man physically. There was great stories about him. Um, where he would throw off his coat and, you know, two men at one point were fighting and he took and picked up both men, one in each arm and held them apart. And he had a great physical stamina 
He rarely got cold. He would, he could, you know, gallop and gallop, gallop for days, go into battle, come back out and just be just fine. He, he really was an amazing physical specimen for his time. He was a very tall man as well in a time when men were pretty short. So they decide we're going to do this plan. Simcoe's plan, though, goes up the chain in, with the British. And as a lot of plans go, they're taken over by other people. And they go, hey, that's a pretty good plan. Well, so the generals over Simcoe took over the plan and said, hey, we, we love your plan, but we're going to make a few changes. And what are those changes? Well, they decide to use the Black Hussars, which were these mercenary Germans that were just brutal. And they had death or glory on their hats. You can kind of see it there in the picture with the skull and crossbones. And they were not the kind of men that took prisoners. They killed everybody. And they're the ones who, uh, in Bunker Hill, impaled Americans to the trees with their swords. Uh, they were nasty. And they've been promised, the Black Hussars have been promised by the Kaiser that if they would go fight over in North America, they could pretty much rape and plunder and do whatever they wanted. And, uh, and the British didn't discourage them. So they were named as the group, you know, that would go up and actually do the kidnapping of George Washington, not the Queens Rangers. And this, you know, this really rankled Simcoe because he wanted to be the one who got uh, Washington, but he's demoted actually to a diversion. Uh, so the new plan is this, a lot more troops, 500 plus. Uh, it's no longer a, a small, compact SEAL Team 6 that's going to go get Washington. It's a much bigger force. And Simcoe's force role in this will be to go first, cross the Hudson, make a lot of noise, a lot of noise in New Jersey, going toward Morton, alert the troops and, and the people around uh, guarding Washington and have them chase him and create a diversion. Meanwhile, the Black Hussars will go up and grab Washington, while everybody will think that Simcoe is actually leading an attack. And so, you know, Simcoe's not happy. It's, it's what it is. So the raid is launched. Um, and in the middle of the night, um, Simcoe takes off. To go create this diversion, the Black Hussars will be taking off uh, soon after him. Now, Washington is in bed. He's going to bed that night um, again with, with Martha. And, um, and again, you know, British are getting real-time intelligence on this. They know exactly where Washington is. They know exactly where the lifeguard is. They know how far his troops are. So there's not a lot of guesswork here. This is all very calculated. It's, you know, we're going to go grab him and then go back across and, you know, they, they explain that the log cabins are a long way. And they are a long way. When you go and you go back to the Ford Mansion, it's a long way away for these troops to try and get there um, in time. And besides all that, they're now going to be chasing this guy, Simcoe, who's, who's going to create, he, who does a great job. He makes a lot of noise. He, they fire shots. Uh, and so what happens is the Americans have these big piers up in the mountains, uh, these big wooden piles of wood that are supposed to be a signal. So they light these, letting everybody know the British are attacking. And this is what's supposed to be the signal the British were attacking. And so, you know, the troops are all starting to head that way after Simcoe. Simcoe turns around and they start this chase where literally they're right behind him. And Simcoe and his men gallop, held a leather back toward the Hudson and, and pull the Americans with them. Meanwhile, the Black Hussars gallop toward the Ford Mansion. Um, and it looks like this is going to be just perfect. Um, the weather is not terrible. It's snowing lightly. Um, and, you know, the weather, it's actually warmed up a little. So actually, things are coming together. It looks like they're going to get there. You know, they're going to be able to slip in. And all the troops have been diverted to you know, Simcoe. And they're going to be able to grab Washington and take off. Well, what happens? The snow starts to change. It starts to change to freezing rain. So it's actually warmed up even more. So this freezing rain is coming down on these layers and layers of snow that have been coming for months of snow, all right? And then 
Then this, the temperature drops and it drops drastically. And that freezing rain hits the top of the snow and turns to ice and creates this crunchy ice. But the snow is deep. So when the horses go through the snow, that frozen snow has now become like glass and it's sharp. And these horses' forelocks start all getting cut by the snow. So as they're galloping, they're leaving this trail of blood. And, you know, they're thinking, well, maybe it won't be so bad if we keep going. But they keep going and the horses start to become lame. Uh, it's just tearing up their forelocks, which is that first joint in their legs. And 10 miles from the Ford mansion, they realize they can't go any further. They realize that their horses are, they won't be able to make it back to the British. The horses are turning lame so fast from all these cut forelocks. And they have rockets. And the rockets, they were told, only use the rockets to signal one thing, the, that the mission is, is off. The mission has been canceled and, and that we're turning back. And so they fire the rockets off. And Simcoe sees those. And the British on, you know, on the other side of the Hudson. And, and the Black Hussars have to come back. So nature is really what does them in at this point, uh, of all things. Now, the British contemplate a second attempt uh, to go across. And they, they, you know, they think about, okay, well, let's, you know, let's do this again. But, of course, what happens? It warms up. And the Hudson starts to thaw. And they miss their window of opportunity. Uh, again, this all came about because, you know, they had this moat. Well, suddenly the moat vanishes and they can't cross. They can't go in there. And Washington, actually, after this happened, Washington heard about this. He he got intelligence that, you know, they, they'd come very close to grabbing him. So also, too, the, the lifeguard unit moved into the Ford Mansion, um, you know, they had a, a watch that was 24-7. Um, you know, the, part of the troops were kept on alert. So it wasn't going to happen again the way it did. Um, and then Washington actually launched a counterattack across the Hudson, a little hit and run thing where the, the British fought them off very easily. But, you know, they just sort of were peppering the British, kind of giving them a little bit more of their own. Now, after all that, we had the battle of Morristown in the spring. So the British are like, you know, we're going to finish them off anyway. All right. And at the same time, Benedict Arnold is enacting his plot to, you know, sell out the Americans, sell out Washington and give the British uh, the fort at West Point, which would cut off the Hudson. It would basically just stop all navigation for the Brit for the Americans there. And this would be a, a real death blow for the uh for the revolution, for the American side. Um, now, the Battle of, of Morristown, the British were going to use a pincer movement. They know Washington's uh, army is weak. They're going to come in from the front, and then they're going to also come around the back and sort of pince them in, in Morristown, New Jersey. And it, they start, and it works beautifully. The Americans fall back. Uh, they actually have them right in their sights, and they're, they're going to be able to... You know, pin them in and, and that'll be it for it. Washington will be bagged. Now, during all this, though, the British general is told that they're going to end up with West Point, that Benedict Arnold has, in fact, given him the, the means, the ability to go get the fort. And the British general, hearing this, says, you know, I'm losing a lot of men and we're going to get this fort and this is probably going to end the war anyway. He pulls back. Um, not knowing that the fort had not been taken yet, just that Ben and Garner had given him the plan, told him nobody's there, go take it, and had set them all up. But they didn't know that the fort hadn't been taken. So when that British general pulled back from, actually, he had Washington bagged, he had Washington trapped, he pulled back at a critical moment uh, and said, no, you know, I'm not going to lose all these men if we're going to get the fort and we'll win the war anyway. So in essence, he let Washington go. Then Benedict Arnold plot is revealed. Washington was supposed to have a breakfast with him, and 
And basically what happened, when, it's all in the book, but one of the men he's working with was discovered. He was searched. He had all the plans in the boot of his, in, in the heel of his boot. They found it. They realized that, you know, they were selling out West Point, that Benedict Garno was involved in this. And so they quickly reinforced West Point and, you know, got the cannons ready and were ready to fight off anybody who came, who came toward West Point. And now Benedict Arnold finds out that his plot's been revealed. And just when Washington is probably a half hour from coming to breakfast with him at this, at this inn, he takes off out the back, leaves his wife there, and escapes down the Potomac. Um, uh, you know, in this dramatic escape, uh, he, he has some friendly loyalists who take him down the Potomac to, to New York. And there he, and his wife, his wife is left behind, but she plays like she's insane to Washington and his men. And she's bereft and she has his child and, and she doesn't know where her husband went and they buy it. They think, oh, this poor woman who's been, you know, who's married to this scoundrel uh, is overwhelmed that she's just been abandoned and they let her go. And so she joins Benedict Arnold in New York where they're still plotting and they're also plotting to leave New York and eventually go, go to Britain. Um, so what's Washington do? He finds out that Benedict Arnold is in New York and he actually sends uh, a spy, uh, a single man down the Hudson in a canoe to go kidnap Benedict Arnold. And, Bennett, and he actually goes to Benedict Arnold's house to get him and Benedict Arnold had just left. He had just left on a ship heading for England. And so he slipped away and, and he and his wife both slipped away. The Battle of Morristown is, is indecisive and George Washington and the army are allowed to fight on and to basically, you know, continue the war all the way up to Yorktown. Um, but this really was a moment where it all was actually coming apart. The army was coming apart he was being sold out by Benedict Arnold. There was a plot to kidnap him. Um, you know, the Battle of Morristown, they had him caught between these two pincers, these two armies. Uh, and again, George Washington beat the odds and just slipped away. Uh, like he, he, he had continued to the whole, the whole time.